Bob Swanson, gentlemen. <laughs> gentlemen, it's indeed a pleasure to be here today. Everybody says, well, what, whatever made you go in for whistles? Well, when I was a kid, I was brought up on a farm. And you know, you can take the boy away from the farm, but you try and take the farm out of the boy, and I guess I still got a lot of farmer in me, and on that farm, what else was there to do? There was a little train went through there, a little puffing billy, you know. And I can remember as a small boy, we had a horse and rig. Everybody else had cars, but my old man, you know, he said, no, we're going to have a horse and a rig, and that's good enough for me, and it's good enough for you. And so we had a little old gray mare called Kitty, and when we went to town, we were trusted to go to town about once a month and pick up supplies and feed and one thing and another, and we got the horse and rig. And we started out. And we were cautioned before we went, now be careful if the train's coming. You know what the horse is like. It shies and all this sort of thing. So when the train was coming, we got that horse blanket, and we threw it over the horse's head, and my oldest brother held the horse away. Of course, I was looking up the track and down the track. And as we looked up and down the track, here's what we saw. There was a stately pillar of smoke. My brother threw the blanket over old Dobbin's head, and I was all eyes and ears. Here's what we heard. <laughs> I can still smell that jingle pot coal smoke. You know, the old jingle pot mine was just right next to us. And that smoke, whenever I smell good Vancouver Island coal smoke, it takes me back to those early days. Now, that sound inspired me. Above all things, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a, an engineer, a locomotive engineer. That's what I want to be, or an engineer of some sort. But that sound that you heard is the signature of the building of Canada. This is the point about that sound. And across the great Canadian plains and over the mighty Rockies, that sound meant that there was another human being somewhere out there in that wilderness. And it wasn't an empty country. And as I vowed as a kid to be an engineer, I vowed with a passing of steam, that sound should never vanish into eternity. That that sound should be preserved because it's the sound that built Canada. Now, when I was a kid, working in the machine shop and this little engine came in and old Charlie Snowden, the hogger, the engineer, he said, uh, Bob, my God darn whistle's gone haywire again, will you fix it? So I'd cut a little more off the bell of the whistle, a little more, a little more, till it got to sound like Dunrobin, you know. And I found that the shorter you made that whistle, the higher pitched it became. Pretty soon we ran out of tube and I put a longer tube on and then she went out with a deep coarse whistle like a foghorn. This pleased me and I found that, well, there must be a, a mathematical relationship between diameter and length. And I'm gonna go into this when I get a little smarter, I thought. Well, as I grew up, I was borrowed off this job I'm on uh, during the war and I was on the Queen Charlotte's. And uh, I used to always make uh, locomotive whistles for my, my good friends, you know, the ones I liked. The ones I didn't like, they do without them, but I made one for a, a fellow up there, and I said, I'll, I'll make the, the very best one. So I, I used the C, a C sharp diminished chord. We took a piece of six inch pipe, and we made it so long, and I calculated the lengths of these different flutes in the side of it. Now with an empty glass here, the whistle principle, the flute principle, is just simply blowing into a cup. You can make that noise with, with steam blowing into a cup, but the heat of steam, it varies, it varies as the absolute temperature of the steam, the frequency does. And the absolute temperature being 460 below, you've got to work this out and put the 32 degrees in or out, whichever it comes to. But you can actually raise the temperature of the fluid blowing the whistle, it will raise the note. This is why steam is so very successful. But on the Queen Charlotte's, I made this whistle to a C-sharp diminished chord, and we tuned it with a guitar. I'll never forget this electrician. He had the guitar plinging away, and I was pouring a little more water in to shorten, and I finally got the lengths. Then we welded little pieces in the bottom. And that whistle, 
sounded beautiful. It was, I figured, the ultimate of all tra steam train whistles. And when the Queen Charlotte's finished logging with locomotives, I phoned Panicky Bell. Panicky Bell today is dead and gone. He's gone to the land of the heavenly timber, you know, met his creator. But he is at the PNE, he's number one logger of British Columbia. Well, anyhow, I phoned Pan Panicky and I said, Panicky, I want that whistle off the five spot. He said, You'll get her, boy. And he wrapped her up in a Hudson's Bay blanket and sent me, and I put it on the 16 at Ladysmith. And here is that whistle. Now, when the first diesels came to Vancouver Island, Vancouver Island on the e n Railway was the first railway dieselized in Canada. It was the guinea pig of the CPR. It always has been, but <laughs> anyhow, they brought a diesel out, and they put it on, and it, of course it had an ordinary boat-type whistle. Uh, it hadn't been Swansonized like, you know. Well, of course, they hadn't heard of this whistle yet. So the first thing, when it was going to Victoria on the very first trip, a gravel truck ran into it at a place called West Home, and it turned the diesel over on its side, rolled it right over and wrecked the gravel truck, and the driver said, well, at least I thought it was another truck. So there was a meeting about it. There has to be a meeting about anything like this. So I was called to Victoria, went to a meeting, and somebody said, can't you do something about those whistles? I said, oh, yeah, all you've got to do is put a C-sharp diminished chord on there, you know, and you'll have it. And the deputy minister said, then do it. I said, well, I'll need some money. Well, he says, you'll have to get your own money. <laughs> so I didn't do, it, do anything, and I went to Ottawa. I was on the coal board that year, and I, we were trying to build the PG on uh, coal out of the Peace River. And I went back to Ottawa on this coal board, finding ways and means of using coal, and I saw the Board of Transport Commission. They, they said, well, these train whistles are coming out in the diesels are a problem because... Uh, we just can't approve that. It doesn't sound like a train whistle. Oh, I said, simple matter, you know, sir. All you have to do, sir, is put a C-sharp diminished chord on there, sir. And uh, yeah, he said, it's not that simple. He said, you're full of prunes, you know. He said, look, <coughs> you're so goddamn smart. He says, we've taken this up with the National Research Council, and they say it can't be done. So he said, if you'll see Dr. Thiessen at the National Research Council, you'll find that you're talking out the top of your hat. So I saw Dr. Thiessen, and he says, no, 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 you can't do it. You see, one is a flute sound, another is a trombone sound. Now, you just can't get a flute sound out of a trombone. You know, he was a nitpicker, this guy. He'd been with the government for 20, 30 years, you know. So, oh, I said, I don't know. He says, oh, no, 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 you're just wasting your time, sonny. You're just wasting your time. Because I was older than I looked, you see, but... I came back and I was just so god darn stupid. You know, some of you fellas know how damn stupid a man can be. Well, I was that way. I said, by God, I'm going to do it. So I made five, I made six actual air horns, special air horns, and I tuned these air horns, figuring that if a Hammond organ can make people think they're hearing a pipe organ, by golly, I can make a set of air horns sound something like a train whistle. Now, a real organist will say, no, 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 it doesn't sound anything like a pipe organ, but the average guy doesn't know the difference, you see. So I came back and I got a Pierce wire recorder and I recorded the CNR and the CPR and I found that there was five or six basic notes on which was super, uh, superimposed certain harmonics. But if this thing was broken down, there was five basic notes. And if the five notes were blown on a properly designed set of air trumpets, you know, with the diaphragm and all this sort of thing, I'd have something that sounded like a, 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 a train whistle. Now, the five notes that I used were these. Those five notes give you a C-sharp diminished chord, or an A7th major, they're very close. It 
before you do any research, you've got to do a lot of homework. Now, I found in the Britannic Encyclopedia, under Chinese, under the heading of Chinese, and this is right, that in 2697, 2697 BC, an emperor by the name of Huang Ti sent his minister. Now, this was a cabinet minister. You can imagine the power this man had to send a cabinet minister out into the woods to cut bamboo pitch pipes. <laughs> and he cut these bamboo pitch pipes, and he came back to the, this with his scientists, and the, 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 the emperor was going to set Middle Sea. And from Middle Sea, in the Chinese philosophy, everything emanated from Middle Sea, you see. And he found that each half tone if it was multiplied, the frequency of each half tone was multiplied by the twelfth root of two, which is one decimal oh five nine four six three one. <laughs> that this is true that you got the frequency of the next next pitch pipe, and they varied, they varied inversely as the frequency, or they varied as the frequency, I should say. Now the diameters, if you look, look at a pipe organ, you'll find that they're all different diameters. A big note has a big diameter. And a little note has a little short one has a thin diameter. And he found that the diameters varied as the 12th, 24th root of 2. So if you took the diameter 1 and you multiplied it by the 24th root of 2, which is 1 decimal 029, goes on for three or four figures, it would give you the, the, uh, the diameter of each pitch pipe. Now he did this and established this. Pythagoras, he was working on a different thing in the, in the, we came up from the Greek, not the Chinese, you see. And Pythagoras figured that two over one is the octave, three over two is the, is the first, uh, first one, the four over three, five over four, and this is the way the Pythagorean scale works. Now, a violin without accompaniment plays on the Pythagorean scale. But what the Chinese had invented, or developed, was a system of the tempered scale. Now, along in history, the Chinese went off in firecrackers and rockets and things, you know. And they didn't bother much about this music, but some Belgian scientists at the beginning of the 18th century came out with the same formula, the 12th root of 2, and gave it the tempered scale. And our pianos today are tuned on the tempered scale. Knowing this, I used the, tw the 12th root of 2, the 24th root of 2 for my diameters to get my, to, to, to vary the loudness and get the blend of the chord together. And I found that a minor third used the 4th root of 2. So I just multiply the frequency of each one by the fourth root of two because uh, four into 12 goes three and this gives you a minor third. You see, you can write a symphony with a slide rule. I don't know what it would sound like. <laughs> now we have all these basic overnotes and octaves and things <clears throat> and I had to develop trumpet shapes. So I developed the trumpet shapes thinking of this guy that knew everything in Ottawa that you didn't want it too trumpety, you wanted it more resonant, so I made more of a parallel shape for the train whistles, and for boat whistles I make a more, uh, I make a catenoidal shape. And then the diameters of the, of, the, of the diaphragms on the first ones varied as the 24th root of two. And the first diesel horn was made at the Vancouver Ironworks, and I put it on a BC electric locomotive at the Kitsilina shops, and here's what we heard. Now, what we had before, I didn't have much to compete with because this is what the diesel came out with. They call that the Bronx cheer down in the States. <laughs> well, anyhow, I didn't have too much to compete with. Now, the Americans are great people and we have some here and we pay great we think very, very highly of our neighbors to the south. But you know, they have a peculiarity. They don't believe anything that they see until someone tells them that it's damn good, you see. So if they're going to sample whiskey, they say, uh, they show a picture of some guy tasting this and he wipes his lips and he says, that's a man's drink. So they all think it's a man's drink. Now, I was asked to take my whistle down to Washington, D.C. and there's no use just going down there saying, well, this is a damn fine whistle. They had to have a man to tell them it was good, see. <laughs> So they hired Captain Charles Benter. He succeeded Sousa with the Marine Band playing for the president. So Captain Charles Benter came out and they didn't have walkie-talkies. They set up a, a telephone line alongside of the track and they had a steam locomotive and they put one of my horns on it that I took down with me with all these square roots of two and 12th roots of 24 and everything. And 
got the thing all hooked up and he went up the track and I told you that the C sharp diminished was very close to a, an A seventh. Well, this man was really a musician. So he went up the track and he phoned down. He says, Swanson, could you uh, change that uh, C sharp diminished chord, he says, to uh, an A seventh major? I says, Certainly, sir. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Yes, sir. I said, sir. So I had it marked and I moved the one number four bell out to flatten it to A from B flat. And I blew it. He said, don't touch a thing. Come on. So he came back on a little, little speeder. He was up the track on the speeder. And he came back and he said, gentlemen, blow that other horn. They blew the one you heard, that honker. He said, that is noise. Now he says, blow this other one. So they blew this horn that you, that my horn. He said, gentlemen, that's music. So they said from then on, it was music. So he said so, so it had to be, you know. <laughs> So we went up to Baltimore for tests and they set a little uh, platform up like a little grandstand and all the presidents of railroads came in and my horn was number 13. And uh, when it blew and they recorded on a wire recorder and they listened to it back, they said, that's the president's whistle. And somebody said, it's, that's my whistle. The guy said to me, he said, look, do you want this whistle to go over here in these here in the United States? I said, sure do. Well, he says, just keep quiet, he said. That's an American whistle. <laughs> so I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, that's an American. He says, American, he says, blueberry pie. I said, with imported blueberries from Canada, you know. <laughs> However, I came back from there very, very, you know, kind of buoyed up. And I went up to the CPR and I showed it to Buck Crump. He says, that's a formidable looking thing. You mean to say we've got to put those things on our locomotives? Well, I said, uh, if the board approves, the board of transport. So I went to the board of transport and I served and I talked, you know, and... They said, well, it takes the five notes all right to do the job, Mr. Swanson, but what does the CPR and the CNR think about it? Well, I said, uh, Mr. Crump thinks maybe three and the CNR. Now, I'll give you a, a, a guess how many went on the CP and CN. They adopted a three-tone whistle on the CP and the CN, and I think there's something like eight or 9,000 of them working. And they sound pretty good. Here is a CPR diesel going out of Vancouver with the 7.30, quarter to eight train in the evening going right through to Montreal. Now here is a K5, a five-tone, at Abbotsford on the BC Electric during the original developments. Now here's one on the dear old Pacific Great Eastern Railway, the third largest railway in Canada. <laughs> now here's one of the Great Northern coming out of the big cut heading for Seattle on the International, engine 510. Now at this point, the principle must be taught. It's not what you hear, it's what you think you hear. If you play one of these sounds to a kid today and say, what's that train? They know it's a train. This is all you got to do is get this across to the young that it's a train, but you'd never get that honking, hooting denizen of the night to be a train in anybody's mind. So if you think you hear a train at a railway crossing and you think you hear a train don't take any chances because that thing takes a mile to stop and you can stop within 30 feet at 20 miles an hour if your brakes are working now just listen to this and tell me what you think <laughs>
Now that was not a train. That was my department automobile. <laughs> Owned by the government with an air compressor on it. So I put a small version of the PGE air horn on there, have it on today, and I blew it one day in front of the hotel and the policeman said, do you hear that noise? Was that a train? I said, sir, you're hearing things. I don't see any train. <laughs> see? <laughs> well, now, I put this and I went to the fourth lake at Nanaimo Lakes and I blew this in the dead of the night. I run the tape recorder, an Ampex tape recorder, and we record it, and I dub those CPR train sounds in with it to fool you. But the point is, if you think you heard a train, this is all that's necessary in the train gear. Get to a railway crossing, say, your wife says, dear, I thought I heard a train. You take it easy, because that thing could be a train, and it will be a train if that's the noise you heard. Now, I, I was getting off the ferry one day, the BC ferry with that, that horn on, and you know that darn thing stuck wide open on me. <laughs> And I blew all the way up through Nanaimo and got away with it. Anyhow, <clears throat> when we dieselized the railroads, something ha else had to be done. So it was a matter of tackling ships. So I analyzed ships' horns, and I found that ships could be diesel whistled so that they sounded respectable. Now, to make a train whistle, it wasn't too bad. You could make a whistle, and you could put it on a train. And you could go out and record it and listen to it, because a train whistle is about so big and weighs about 35 pounds. But a ship's whistle can weigh up to a ton. The Queen Mary's whistle weighs over a ton, ton and a half. And you get these big ships, it would take two men to lift the whistle itself. So I had to have a place to test whistles, because you can't go down to the CPR Princess of Vancouver and say, I want to try a new whistle today. You just can't do this sort of thing, you know. So I developed a whistle farm. And I got the last skitter out at Nanaimo Lakes of Crown Zellerback's tree farm, and I fixed the boiler up. In fact, I did my own inspection, and it's good, believe me. And I have that 200 pounds of steam, I put locomotive air pumps on it, and I have air, and I have a place to test the whistles. Then I had to make an echoic chamber, an, an echoless chamber, to put them in and blow them so I could develop decent ship's whistles. Now then, if so, let's just say I developed a bunch of large whistles, fat, two or three families of big ships whistles that'll fit anything from a fishing vessel up to a big ship. And with less time here, we've got to go on. But if you were ever standing on the dock in New York, or you were standing in Southampton, you might hear this sound. That is the Queen Mary. And if you were ever going to Victoria in the old days, you'd get the midnight boat. It was a gracious way of living. You'd go down to the boat at half past 11, you'd go down into the dining room, you'd eat with beautiful china, silverware and everything. You'd go up on deck after, you'd look around, you didn't know what might be on board, and there was a little old stateroom waiting for you, you know? And here's what you heard right sharp at 12 o'clock, midnight. <laughs> That was the old Joan. Then there was the Princess of Victoria. How many remember the old Princess of Victoria? Here she is. Then there was the Princess Marguerite going under the bridge in West Vancouver. When I was a kid, the old mine, num number one esplanade, the old, the old mine whistle blew from 1887 right through to the time it shut down in 1937. And this is a recording of the actual whistle. <laughs> Remember the old sea lion that used to run around and could play tunes? This is a classic.
then there was the Mauritania. That is the old Mauritania. That they had to cut the top off the masts to get her into the breakers. Here she is, the mate to the Lusitania. And it's a Chimanus Mill on Vancouver Island, the largest steam whistle in Canada. Here's the Southern Cross running between Liverpool and Australia. One of my whistles. Here's the BC ferries between the Horseshoe Bay and Vancouver. Here is one during Foghorn developments for the Department of Transport Ottawa on Foghorns at Albert Head. Now, that foghorn wasn't acceptable. It didn't have a grunt on the end. They said it's got a go, it's got a grunt. Well, I found the grunt was a minor third. And what you learn, you know, Kipling said, what you learn from the yellow and black will help you a lot with the white. Well, what I learned from trains helped me with boats and foghorns. So I just simply got two horns with the right that, was all, that were already developed, and I put them together with a quick crossover switch, and here is the result, which is really a diaphone and only uses one-seventh of the air. You think uh, you heard a foghorn. It really wasn't. This was at Nanaimo Lakes at the Whistle Farm. But with all this, they're now using these foghorns in Scotland even with a Canadian accent. This is a good thing. <laughs> but the latest thing was when the federal government finally came back and said, Mr. Swanson, can you make a horn that plays O Canada for our centennial train? I said, certainly it can, I can. But it's got to sound like a train playing O Canada, not like a pipe organ or anything else. And I wrote back and forth and sent tapes back and forth. They finally flew a man out here and they said, go ahead and make it. Here it is. The Centennial Train. Now, when they did this, they had eight caravans, and they said, we want eight more O Canada whistles, but we want these in a more or less of a carnival type of sound. We don't want it so uh, ethereal, you know, so highfalutin as that one. We want it more kind of horny-like. So, being a kind of a horny guy, <laughs> this is what they got on the caravans. Well, I thought, why stop at that? There was nothing bigger around here than the BC Hydro. So I developed, and I thought, one for every province in Canada. This will make 10 O Canada whistles, and I'll put 10 on top of the hydro. If I can do that, I'll stand on the top of the hydro building, and I'll say, of all my rash adventures past, this frantic feat must prove the last. <laughs> and so, by God, I got an air compressor on top. It's amazing what you can do, you know, if you just get enthused and try. And I got an air compressor up there, three air tanks. I tested them myself, too, you know. And I got these whistles. Uh, Ten whistles out to the whistle farm after they were tuned. I tuned them on the 24th of May, and I got it on the top of there, and she goes off automatic except when somebody plugged in the wrong plug one morning. And this is what you hear on top of the hydro. Well, now we have a O Canada. 